Because in this day and age, and you're going to have to excuse me because I'm going to need a little liquid for my throat, but I think especially in this day and age, when everybody questions everything, when nothing is considered sure or true, I find it very ironic that the world I live in tells me that truth is subjective. That reality is in fact subjective. Your reality may be different than my reality. And that comes from a point of view where suddenly I take my place instead of God. I become the center of the universe. I become the most important thing in the world. And so therefore, if I feel or I think, it therefore is so. And there is a problem with that. And the problem is, is that too often we listen to that kind of stuff and we get influenced by it in a very negative way. The title I'm speaking on today is called Comprehending an Incomprehensible God. And I'm here to tell you that anyone who tells you they completely understand God is fooling themselves. I do believe that we can understand some aspects of God, but I also truly believe that while eternity will go on forever and ever, I suspect the first hundred thousand years of eternity maybe even the entire eternity, will be getting to know God, to understanding Him in a way that we could not in the world. He is that mighty. He is that strong. Imagine an ant walking by the Empire State Building. That ant's ability to understand what that building is, what goes on in that building, is almost impossible. Certainly the ant knows the building exists, and certainly it knows there is activity, but to comprehend what goes on inside that building is way beyond that ant's ability. And you and I, my friends, are that ant next to the Empire State Building when it comes to God. We do understand certain aspects, and I think it is important that we understand certain aspects about God. And there are some things we can comprehend, but there are also things that we have to expect and realize we cannot understand. My first scripture today comes from Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the laws of God, I will also forget your children. Hosea is pretty clear. We are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And that knowledge is not just school learning, as you folks might have grown up hearing. It's the knowledge of God. And we should not take that warning lightly. I need to understand God better than I do, better than I have. And I will tell you, that quite frankly, when it comes to knowing God, you will spend a lifetime getting to know Him, getting closer to Him. And even then, now with a lifetime of studying and learning, you will realize there are so many aspects of God you still do not understand. And that's okay, because like I said, much like the ant, I have to understand that my understanding is not enough to grasp what God is. But it is important that I have the understanding to grasp that God is and that He desires to be in my life. It reminds me a bit of a story whose dad, a young boy's dad, brought home a children's play set. And he was in the backyard trying to put this together. And slot A going with heart B with C goes to D and then don't go there but do this instead he was getting very frustrated because the instructions while they were written in English seemed to be written in everything but English and 
His neighbor, an old handyman, came over, saw he was having trouble, and he sat down and without even looking at the instructions, he slowly began to put the things together. And the neighbor was quite impressed. He says, you never even looked at the instructions. And the neighbor smiled, he says, well, sir, I do not read or write. And when you have, cannot read or write, you must learn to think. And I think that is true of us as well. I will not understand God completely. I will not completely grasp the totalitarianism of God. But it is important that I do grasp what I can. That I do think. That I do come into terms with God. To put it another way, Charlie and Doreen will probably shortly be going to Texas and enjoying that wonderful weather and missing all our wonderful weather. And I don't know why. They just, why they can't enjoy the 20 below zero stuff that we do, but they just do. But let's say for hypothetical reasons that I send a pint jar with Doreen and I said, when you get down there, go to the Gulf of Mexico and get me a pint of water of the Gulf of Mexico and bring it back. And she does. And I put that pint jar on the desk and I said, there on that desk is the Gulf of Mexico. Would I be correct? I mean, the water came from the Gulf of Mexico. It significantly is the Gulf of Mexico. But, as you are fully aware, when she took that pint jar and filled it, the Gulf of Mexico did not disappear. In fact, it, I didn't even notice that pint jar. The Gulf of Mexico was still there and frankly was not even phased by a pint jar taken from it. That is very much like you and me understanding God. We are a small pint jar taking a small look at God from our human perspective and believing that we know and understand God. And I'm here to tell you that it is important to have your pint jar of God there and to understand what you can. But never ever forget that what we understand is such a small insignificant part of who God is that we will never in this human life come close to comprehending God. He is so far above us. And I think sometimes when we pray, we forget that. I mean, I pray frequently with right answers. God, here's the answer. Here's the solution. I want this to happen. We're all guilty of that, you know. We, we go to God with what we know is right. And we tell God what he is supposed to do. Without questioning, without thinking that maybe God has a different plan. That perhaps God knows better than we do. And I think that arrogance, if we're not careful, can take us away from God. When Paul wrote Philippians... He was a man who knew a lot about learning about God. Paul wrote Philippians in jail shortly before he was to be executed for his faith. He had rejected a life of being a leading Pharisee. Had Paul not become a Christian, no doubt he would have been a leader in the Jewish faith throughout his time. And I think it's interesting as we read Philippians to see what Paul thought that meant when he turned his back on that. And in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11, he says, Whatever I gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ 
and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's amazing to me that Paul, a significant leader, and like I said, a promising young man in the church, considered it rubbish for his past life. What he gave up was of no account. And what he said was, I consider it rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. Now Paul died a man still not knowing about God completely. Paul still had much to learn, as you and I do also. But Paul understood that getting to know God better was worth more than anything else in this world. He desired to know and comprehend God in a more full way than he did the day before. That desire drove him. That desire led him to do what he did. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He led three missionary tours. And he was martyred for Christ in Nero's court. That's a man who lived a solid Christian life. And I suggest that he did that because of what he comprehended and what he knew of God. To know God, and we use that word know pretty easily. I mean, I know all of you, and you all know me, but I don't know you well. Some of you, I might be hard pressed to remember this or that, or you know, other facts. The truth of it is, we know on a surface level most of the time. With God, that's also true. I don't always know God as deeply as I could or I should. And I get frustrated because when I find things in the scripture that say you will not understand him completely, then there's part of me that says, well, I guess there's no need to try it. If I can't understand him completely, why try to understand him at all? And there's a danger in that because to be honest with you, we are called to seek to understand, to comprehend what we can in our small minds. As ants next to the Empire Building, we're called to at least acknowledge what that building is and how it affects our life and how it should affect our life. Going from Philippians, we're going to go back to Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. And seek the Lord while you may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Like I said, when we pray, sometimes we pray with our mindset. We pray with our intent, and we want God to do it our way, because we clearly understand better. You know, there's an old joke about how there are some folks who believe that they are there to advise God on how he should do things. And if God would just listen, the world would be so much better off. There's a fallacy in that attitude because what it is is the same ideology and the same idolatry that the pagans use. What it says is, I am God. I myself know better than anyone else what the right answer is. I do not humble myself before a God. I do not humble myself to suggest 
that I may not have all the right answers. And therefore, what I know, what I believe, is therefore the concrete fact. And if God does not agree with that, then God is wrong. It's pretty clear in the Bible what happens to folks with that attitude. You see it all throughout the Old Testament. You see it through the New Testament. People with that attitude fall flat on their face, and they frequently go right straight to hell. I am not trying to suggest that we should not seek to know God more, that we should not petition God with our desires. I am not suggesting that we should not, as in any relationship, spend time telling God what we feel and how we desire things to go. Because our God is a loving and compassionate God, and He desires to know our heart. And I firmly believe that we as Christians are called to, in fact, bring those folks that we know and our problems to God. Because it is part of our relationship with God. It helps in our relationship of understanding with God. As a young Christian, I prayed a lot of prayers that God had answers like no. And I'll be honest with you, when he told me no, I frankly did not like it. Believe it or not, I was obstinate enough to believe that I knew right and wrong, and if God said no, then that made God wrong. Now that was as a young Christian, and as I look, as I got older, and I see how my life has progressed, and I see what would have happened had God said yes to some of those prayers, I could see where I would be in a much more of a mess, where I would have been in a much bigger problem. But even worse, the number of times where I didn't go to God at all to get the yes or the no, but I so certain of my rightness didn't bother to pray about it. I just charged forward because I knew this was it. And almost to a T, every time that I did not put God into the situation, when I did not ask God, those situations generally turned out miserable. Some of them catastrophic. And I'm here to tell you folks, it's not just unique to me. It's the human behavior. If I don't seek God, if I don't seek Him in my decisions, if I don't seek Him in knowledge and understanding His ways, I will have problems. I will fail and I will struggle. It is a given. And it's not unique. It's throughout the entire 66 books of this Bible that you see people doing exactly that. And like I said, some people get a little frustrated because when they say, you'll never understand God completely, some folks will say, well, you know what? Then why try? If I'm never going to get to where I know what I know, why bother? I mean, after all, I can study for thousands and thousands of hours and I still won't understand. I'll spend that thousand hours doing something else watching something edifying, like TV. That's being sarcastic, by the way, in case you didn't catch that. Uh, the truth of it is, we are to seek God, knowing we are not going to understand Him completely, but knowing that by seeking Him, by trying to understand Him a little more, that it will be beneficial. My next scripture is from Psalm 32. And Psalm 32 is a scripture that was written by David. And it was one of my favorite scriptures. And I am not reading the whole scripture because it's a great psalm. But it's about David coming to terms with a decision he made without God when he sinned with Bathsheba. And the consequences of that and the consequences of hiding that sin and what happened. 
And but starting in verses seven or six rather, he talks about what it means to get back to God. And it says, Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble that surrounds me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eyes on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding, but must be controlled by a, bride, a bit and a bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. It is, I think, very telling that David wrote this after being confronted by the greatest, one of the greatest sins of his life, where he took Bathsheba and then slept with her, got her pregnant, and then when he found out he couldn't conceal it, he had her husband killed. A despicable thing. Hardly a fact of godly man. And God, David definitely paid this price for the complication of that sin. Even though he was forgiven. But what David is saying here is that God can and will instruct you. He will teach you if you are willing. But he warns us not to be stubborn and strong-willed. Because to be honest with you, to live like that just means to increase the number of troubles you're going to face in this world. If you think you have enough troubles and you don't really want any more, my suggestion to you is quit ignoring God. Start listening to God. It will go better. I'm not saying you'll go problem free, but I will tell you that it will go a lot easier. David understood something very seriously true. We will experience trouble in this life, but we will experience more trouble if we are not listening to God. It reminds me of a story of a gentleman had horse or some dogs for sale, and the boy was delivering a papers, and he wanted to see the dogs and the puppies. And as the dog came around the corner, all the dogs, the puppies came running, very happy. And there was one dog that kind of limped and wasn't very good. And he said, what's wrong with that dog? He said, well, he said, we had x-rays done and that pup is missing a hip bone. He's never going to be right. He's going to suffer all of his life. And the little boy says, how much are these dogs? And the guy said, they're $25. And that was the boy's just like side. And he goes, Mister, how about I give you 50 cents a week what I make on my paper route until I can buy that lame dog? The boy said, the man that was selling the dog said, Why would you want him? The other puppies are so much better. They're going to be able to play and do all the things that a young boy like you want to do. Why do you want to have that lame dog? And the boy paused, pulled up his pant leg, and showed him the steel braces of his own leg because he suffered from polio. And he says, Mister, this dog is going to need someone who understands what it's like to be where he is. And I believe I'm that person. He says, I want to buy that dog. My friends, Jesus Christ died for you and for me. He understands where you live. He understands your pain. He understands your difficulty. He understands all the infirmities that you feel. And he did that so that he could come to us as a loving 
Heavenly Father and deliver us from our sin. That He could take us and show us just how much He loved us. This story about the puppy reminds me that God wants to have a relationship with you and me. He wants to have a closeness with you and me. To do that, you must be willing to have that relationship with Him. You must desire Him in your life. More than the world, more than all the other things, will I fully understand Him? No. When the little children came to play with Jesus, the disciples were quick to try and send them away because he was busy. And Jesus was very quick to say, do not impair the kids from coming. I want them. And he did not take and teach them deep theological things that he could have. He did not spend time educating them. What he did was he loved them. He showed them he cared. He desired to create a relationship with them. It is the same today as it was then. You, my friends, are the children that Jesus Christ desires to have at his side. You are the ones he desires to understand him more. To want to seek him. To want to come into his presence. But you and I are also left with a dilemma because we also understand that as much as I want to get closer to God and as much as He desires for me to become closer, I will never completely understand God, perhaps not even in heaven. It may take all of eternity to know just how massive God is. I may spend eons learning about God. You know, some people think, well, we're going to heaven and we'll sit around playing harps and we'll get bored quickly. And I'm here to tell you, the one thing you will never be in heaven is bored. Heaven is going to be an active place. There will be a lot going on. And one of the things going on is that you will be getting to know God closer and closer each day. So it's going to be a dilemma that you and I face that I'm not going to understand God completely on this earth but that shouldn't stop me from trying to understand him more than I do I should never get frustrated because I don't understand enough I should as that little boy who wanted to care for that puppy desire a relationship with someone who cared enough about me that he not only came to earth and suffered like I do, but he died for me. He died for you. A God who loves you that much is a God you should seek, that you should seek to understand more than you do. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, if you do seek God, if you do seek to understand him more, you will find him. But you can also go throughout your life comfortable that you know enough, comfortable that you think you know it all, or unfortunately, like many, comfortable that you have all the right answers already and you don't need God's help with the right answers. And that will take you down a fool's road. So my friends, as we face the days today, Try to understand an incomparable God. Try comprehending just a little bit of who God is. Because my friends, He is truly amazing. And He is truly worth knowing better than we do. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. If we'll turn to number 421...